Angela and Mr. Ray. Angela is applying to join the library. Listen to the conversation and complete the form below. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will never hear the recording a second time. Hello. How can I join the library? Well, you need to make an application. Would you like to do it now? Yes, if I can. One moment and I'll get the form. Now, I just need to ask you a few questions before you sign at the bottom. Okay. Your full name, please. Angela Mary Price. Price? Yes, that's right. Okay, and your address? Apartment 3, 86 Bridge Street, Pimlico. Bridge Street? That's just near here, isn't it? Yes, not very far. Good. So the postcode must be 2065, right? Yes, that's right. Now, your telephone number. I need both home and work if you have them. My home number is 8763-5142. And work is 8456-1307. Do you need anything else, like ID or something? Yes, your driver's license will do, if you have one. Right. It's easy to remember. I know it by heart. 4040AC. I'm afraid I'll also need to see it. Okay. Here it is. Thanks. And your date of birth, please? 24 March 1981. Okay. Thanks. That's the most important part completed. But if you don't mind, I'd also like to ask you a few questions for a survey we're conducting. Yes, that's okay. Now you have some time to read questions 6 to 10. As the conversation continues, answer questions 6 to 10. What kind of books do you like to read? Here's a list to look at. Oh, it varies from time to time, but I always like to relax and learn about other countries I might visit one day. I don't like anything too heavy or serious, unless it's about animals or the environment. I'm not really into sport very much. Anything else? Well, I do like entertaining at home. You know, dinner parties. So I suppose you'll have something for me in that line. The pictures in those books always make me hungry, although they never seem to turn out exactly as they look in the books. Fine. I think that's all I need now, except I need you to sign here on the application form. Oh, and I almost forgot. The membership fee is $20, which is refundable if you no longer stay a member. There you are. Do I sign at the bottom here? Yes, that's right. You can borrow books now if you wish, although your membership card won't be ready until next week. So if you want to borrow today, you can pick up your card when you return your first books. That's if you want to take some now. I think I will, but I'll have a look around first. Okay. Take your time. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 2. You are going to hear an interviewer who is interviewing Alan. He made a great discovery of Mungo National Park. First look at questions 11 to 15. As you listen to the first part of the interview, answer questions 11 to 15.
An event occurred in 1996 over a period of three days that attracted considerable attention at the time and led to a new find in Mungo National Park, which is the focal point of the Willandra Lakes World Heritage Area in New South Wales, Australia. I talked to Alan Moore, the organizer of this trip, about his experience. Alan, what was the purpose of your trip? Well, as you know, I love the outback and lead tours of people wanting to go into more remote parts of the country. However, I thought it was time for me too to have a holiday. So I packed up my family and we went to Mungo National Park. Why did you choose this location? It holds a record of Aboriginal life stretching back over 40,000 years. And of course, I wanted my young kids to be amazed by the main feature of the park, the remarkable Walls of China, as they're called, where wind and water erosion have exposed this long history. I see. What was the weather like? It was unusual for that time of year. The rain was just one continual downpour after another. We were always soaked to the skin. So we decided to cut our holiday short and only stayed three days in the end. However, it was eventful. The obvious problem was to get back to the nearest town, a small place called Buranga. But the dirt roads out there are always impassable after rain, so we settled down for a long, wet wait in the park. We didn't really mind because the scenery was so interesting. However, the kids wandered away without our noticing, and eventually we realized they must be lost. So we used our two-way radio to contact the park rangers and the police, and a helicopter was sent. Luckily, the kids were found within a few hours, but they'd made an important discovery. Now look at questions 16 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 16 to 20. So, the trip was also eventful for another reason, wasn't it? Yes, yes. They led us to some ancient aboriginal art. The kids had taken shelter in a very small, low cave that was difficult to see from the outside. We were lucky to have another family camping in our location. When they heard us calling the kids, they immediately helped us search for them, and as the hours went by, they also provided us with much-needed support and encouragement. We really appreciated their help, and as we were already soaked through after looking for the kids for a couple of hours, they even made sure we had enough dry clothes to wear. The park ranger managed to get through to us to lead the search, and when the helicopter pilot notified us by two-way radio that he'd seen the children but was unable to land nearby, we were able to eventually find them very excited about what was in their little cave. And what did you think of their cave? Well, after squeezing in, I must say I was impressed and managed to take a few photos of it before we left. There were many faint markings and dots on the wall. It was difficult to tell what they represented because they were so small, but people from the museum who have since visited there said the markings were similar to some other findings in the area and later confirmed they were very old. Although it's now a protected site, the children like to call it their cave and are allowed to visit it when a ranger can go with them. Thank you, Alan. If you go to Mungo National Park, you can see the entrance to the cave and some of Alan's photos at the ranger's station. Alan continues to lead tour groups in the outback, and if you want further information... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear two university students discussing a social science lecture they attended. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Did you go to the first social science lecture yesterday? Yeah. Didn't you see me there? No. I was trying so hard to understand the lecturer. What didn't you understand? A lot of it, really. For example, he said we needed to study history as part of the course, but I didn't get why. You probably missed it. He said early on that we need to learn from our past mistakes. Right. But he also said we need to put ourselves in the place of our ancestors. Why is that? I think the point is that it's not enough to know how they lived and what they did. We need to know what they thought. I see. And I've written transferable skills in my notes next, but I have no idea what that means. If you study social science, you learn skills that you can use in a job. Oh, right. Is that all? Okay, but why is that? The point he made was that in studying social science, you use a flexible and adaptable approach to learning. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. He also kept mentioning all the other subjects we will need to study as part of the course. I didn't write them all down, did you? Some of them. I think I can make sense of my notes. The first one was anthropology, which he said would cover prehistory and archaeology as well. Okay. Then there's economics. I wrote down that this was not meant to mean that we will spend all our time looking at economic theory, but more that we need to see how humans behave. That's good. I don't think I could handle economic theory. He said something about education too, didn't he? Yeah. He said we'll be looking at how cultural information is handed down from one generation to the next through teaching children. He said we'd be focusing on geography, too, but I can't really remember which aspects. Can you? I noted it down, I think. Here we are, yes, particularly in relation to urban planning. It's law that I got confused about. I didn't understand why he linked that to economics. I think he meant that laws affect the way wealth is distributed. That makes sense. Now, what are the science wars? Okay, I did get that. The science wars are about how social science collects information. In sociology and social work, and in social science generally, they can only study patterns of behavior and observe. If you compare that to the way scientists work in physics or chemistry, it's very different because they use specific experiments that can be tested and which give concrete answers. Social studies is often accused of being unscientific. That's all. Okay. But it still looks like a good course, doesn't it? You don't have any regrets, do you? None at all. I'm looking forward to it. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
you are going to hear the first part of a lecture on American culture and American customs. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Well, last week we talked about American education and today I'm going to discuss American values, characteristics, personal habits and courtesies. Keep in mind as you are listening to this lecture that your goal is to understand, not to emulate or judge. Just briefly, I'd like to mention that there is a remarkable ethnic diversity in the United States. The population of the USA is about 260 million. 73% of the American population is white. 12% is African American. 8% Hispanic. 3% Asian or Pacific Islanders. And less than 1% American Indian or Eskimo. Many Americans resent generalizations being made about them because Americans see themselves as very unique and individualistic. On the other hand, Americans tend to lump foreigners together into one lot and condescendingly view foreigners as people who are not as intelligent or sensible as Americans. Despite Americans' dislike of generalisations and their ethnocentric point of view, it becomes evident that they are indeed American. Americans value individualism, independence, informality, directness, punctuality, achievement and competition. Individualism is probably the most highly esteemed value in the American culture and an important key to understanding American behaviour. In the historical development of the country, individuality was crucial for survival. If you asked Americans to characterise the ideal person, they would probably use adjectives such as autonomous, independent and self-reliant. Persons tend to be viewed as individuals rather than as representatives of a family or a group. Here are some examples of how this value affects behaviours. 1. If a group of friends go to a restaurant, everyone wants to pay their own way. In other words, they want to have separate checks and not be someone's guest. 2. In friendships, which seem to initially develop more quickly in the US than in other cultures, the Americans may feel uncomfortable if you give them more help than they need. This is a tendency to draw back and see dependency as weakness. In some ways, the stress on the individual rather than the family or group has led to a more informal society. Sometimes this lack of formality is viewed by members of other cultures as a sign of lack of respect. But that is not the intention in the American value system. This informality is even more predominant on the university campus than in other segments of society. Some ways in which you might see this value expressed in behaviours are 1. You will generally be on a first-name basis with other students in spite of any age differences. 2. Dress is very informal on campus. 3. Language is informal and sometimes confusing. Phrases like, see you later, and drop by any time, are not meant literally. They are informal ways of saying goodbye. Americans are direct. Honesty and frankness are more important to Americans than saving face. They may bring up impolite conversation topics which you may find embarrassing, too controversial or even offensive. Americans are quick to get to the point and do not spend much time on formal social amenities.
This directness encourages Americans to talk over disagreements and to try to patch up misunderstandings themselves, rather than ask a third party to mediate disputes. It is particularly interesting to see what behaviours have culturally become associated with straightforwardness. One, a firm handshake somehow has come to be interpreted as a sign of sincerity. Two, looking at a person when you speak to him or her gives an indication of honesty. Three, in a question of honesty versus politeness, honesty wins. It is considered better to refuse graciously than to accept an invitation and not go. Four, you will be taken at your word. If you refuse food the first time it is offered, to be polite, it may not be offered again. An American will not know that your initial refusal is politeness. Great value is attached to time in the U.S. Punctuality is considered an important attribute. As with all values, there are different rules of acceptability in different cultures. In the U.S., you should be present for school or business appointments at the exact time agreed upon. In social appointments, you can arrive ten to fifteen minutes after the agreed upon time without giving offence. If you are invited somewhere for dinner and are more than fifteen minutes late, you will need to offer an apology and an explanation. A phone call explaining you have been detained and will be late will save face for you and patience for the other person. Americans also value achievement and competition. The American style of friendly joking or banter, of getting the last word in, and the quick and witty reply are subtle forms of competition. Although such behaviour is natural to Americans, you may find it overbearing or disagreeable. Americans are obsessed with records of achievement in sports, and sports awards are often displayed in their homes. Also, sometimes books and movies are judged not so much on quality, but on how many copies are sold, or on how many dollars of profit are realized. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Mm -hmm.